Hello, Audacious Church. How good it is to be with you today. And I trust that what I'm going to share with you will be a blessing to your Christian walk. When I was seven years of age, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was an amazing experience of forgiveness and redemption. And the story or the passage of scripture that God used to speak to my young heart was the story of the runaway slave called Onesimus. Today, I want to take that story and talk about the subject of forgiveness. The Christian is represented in this story by two Christians. The first is Paul the Apostle, and he was in prison at the time of Onesimus's betrayal and runaway. And then the second person is the person of Philemon. Philemon was a Christian wealthy man who was a slave owner and was converted to Christ through Paul's ministry in Colossus. The letter was written around about AD 6061. Now in this story, forgiveness was required from three different sources. The first source was from God himself. We are not too sure of Onesimus's contact with Paul and how this happened. But what we do know is this, in that contact, Paul led Onesimus to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our first port of call, of course, in seeking forgiveness is always the vertical one. Transgression is first and foremost against God. And on this occasion, how we thank God that in this restricted imprisonment environment in Rome, God's forgiveness was never in doubt and was freely available. The second place forgiveness was required was in this great statesman of the church, Paul the Apostle. Now you might ask the question, why does Paul have to forgive Onesimus? Now I would suggest two reasons for that. One, because if God can forgive him, then we should forgive him. And in the case of Paul, there was an obligation there on his Christian life. But also, too, because Paul's friend Philemon had been wronged and disrespected. None of us like our friends to be wronged. And if they are wronged, then very often we are the people that come to their side and take their position in life. And this anger and unwillingness to forgive could have been in the heart of Philemon, we don't know. And so Paul could easily have fallen into the trap of not forgiving him. But he did. The third person, of course, is Philemon himself, the man betrayed and wronged. He had every ground to bring Onesimus to justice and punishment and his wrong behavior, for his wrong behaviour. Now, if we stop and think for a moment about what is at stake here, there are enormous issues. If any of these three persons had failed to face the challenge of forgiveness, the impact of the church would have been seriously damaged, if not made totally irrelevant. Unforgiveness from God would have meant eternal death for Onesimus. Unforgiveness in Paul and Philemon would offer no hope to the guilty. They would be left adding only another contribution to the problems of, the frag bed of a fragmented world. We thank God, however, that all three stepped into the challenge on this occasion and gave forgiveness willingly. Now, what does forgiveness bring to this story? Well, it gives a complete new start for Onesimus. Instead of running away for the rest of his life, he can stop and he can acknowledge his failure and he can be accepted and forgiven. Forgiveness in the story brings Onesimus into a new relationship. In fact, into new relationships with God now he's a member of the family of God. With Paul, he's now called the spiritual son of Paul. And with Philemon, reconciliation, but elevation too. 
no longer a slave, but a brother in Christ Jesus. You see, our ability to forgive has an impact on our relationships with God, with each other, the message of the church, and the person who has offended us. No wonder Jesus was so emphatic regarding the importance of forgiving each other. Forgiveness is a determining factor in who we say we are and how we hope to live our lives. When we fail to forgive, bitterness takes root in our hearts and chokes the very vitality out of us. When Paul writes to Philemon, he, he does not begin with this request to forgive Onesimus. Quite the opposite. He, he begins with a penning appreciation for the relationship that he has with Philemon. Now, this is very important. So Paul is coming and he is going to make a plea on the back of their relationship and their Christian standing. And he says these words in verses four to seven. I always thank God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Now, this is so important to grasp hold of this morning. We must never undervalue the importance of our relationship with each other. It is out of this deep respect for each other and this unity of love that we can work together to accomplish things that if left on our own, we would miserably fail in. Paul, who is often viewed by some as being quite a hard man, is seen in a completely different light in this journey of Onesimus' reconciliation. In Paul's big request, you know, the appeal on the basis of love, the great ask from the old Christian, the cry from his prison chains, we see this humble man who is not imposing his position as an apostle, but rather appealing to the Christian nature that he knows Philemon has. And in verse 12 to 22, he says words like this, I would like to keep Onesimus with me, but I am sending him to you. I don't want to do anything without your consent. If you consider me a, a partner, uh, if, if he owes you anything, I will repay it. He's saying, go the extra mile, by the way. And by the way, prepare a room for me because I'm still your friend and I'm coming to stay with you, I hope. So what is all of this saying? It is highlighting the fact that Paul and Philemon are partners. And what we do together should come out of our united understanding of what God would want us to do. In this case, forgive and reinstate the offender. Paul's letter to Philemon represents in full color the beautiful and majestic transition from slavery to kingship that comes because of Christian love and forgiveness being shown. In sending Onesimus back to Philemon, Paul was saying, forgiveness cannot be ignored. It is not an option. It is a necessity if you are a Christian. So how do, what do we learn from this area of forgiveness today? Paul gives us the answer at the beginning of this letter in verse three. He says these words, grace to you. And then right at the end of his short letter, he says in verse 25, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So this is what we learn. To learn to forgive when you focus on grace. This letter has a challenging, meaty filling, but it is wrapped around in grace. 
The word grace in biblical parlance can, like forgiveness or repentance or regeneration, salvation, mean something as broad as describing the whole of God's favor towards us. Or it can be as narrow as describing one segment of that activity. An accurate common definition describes grace as the unmerited favor of God towards man. In other words, we must never presuppose that we are better than someone else or that we deserve something from God that others don't. We all stand on the same ground. None of us are exempt from doing wrong. None of us deserve favor. We all need forgiveness. But forgiveness is only possible through grace, as Paul says. Received grace brings peace, reconciliation, and a preferred future. Today, you might have forgiveness in your heart. Your reply might be to me, but Paul, you don't know what they did to me. Or you might say, you don't know what they said to me and how much it hurt. No, I don't. But this I do know, unforgiveness will enslave you and damage your relationship with everyone you share your unforgiveness with. And so step back a moment and try and imagine what the outcome of this letter was like for Onesimus. He had done wrong, ran away, left his employment as a sinner. But now he's returning. He's returning with a hope. He's got a letter in his hand. And very soon this is going to turn his hope into reality. The front door is open. Arms are outstretched. Joy is everywhere. Grace has conquered. There is no bitterness, revenge or hate. Love prevails. The future beckons. There is everything for everyone to live for. This is the outcome of forgiveness. Today, God wants his church to be a forgiving church, a place where we, like Paul, realize we are what we are only by the grace of God. His grace alone can make this happen. A forgiven church should be a forgiving church. So if you are a Christian today and you have unforgiveness in your heart, it's time to wipe the slate clean by forgiving because you are a recipient of forgiveness. We're going to pray that God may help us because the step to forgiveness can be a big one, but it has great returns. And so let's pray right now that God will help us to be people of forgiveness. Lord Jesus, we thank you today because when we get rid of our unforgiveness, we are made free. And Father, we want to be those people who give other people a start in life, a new start in life. And Lord, we do want to remove from our own hearts any impediment that would carry any source of unforgiveness. Make us clean, keep us holy, help us to ever look at your grace and ever be grateful that you favored us when we didn't deserve it. And so today we say a big thank you to you. And we step into this day, Lord, with a desire not to harbor anything in our hearts, but rather to be transparent and strong and forgiving. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.